So thank you very much, Daniel, for that generous introduction and also for inviting me to participate in the forum and to my, um, my longtime collaborator and partner in crime, Steve Topic, and for all of you for rescuing me from single digits with a wind chill of minus 10 last Saturday. So I am very, very happy to be here right now. You have no idea. Um, and uh, um, as you know, we've been hearing a lot about the travel ban uh, and in, uh, re of late um, and recently the revised travel ban. And that sounded eerily similar to uh, an earlier ban on Jewish refugees during the early 1940s in the United States, um, right at the start of World War II. And although there are some parallels between the two bans, um, there are also some compelling differences. And what I hope is, is after I've talked about this case study in the 1940s, you and I, that's collectively, we're gonna have a conversation that's gonna do some similarities and differences between the two travel bans. So, so take what you can from this particular case study of Roosevelt and restricting Jews, and then we'll talk about the efforts to keep Muslims out uh, from, what is it, six countries now uh, in, uh, in the present day um, and see what we can make of this. Um, so um, let me start off by setting the stage by providing some background. We're going to start in the year, in the summer of 1938, when Jewish refugees were fleeing uh, most immediately Austria. More than close to 200,000 refugees were fleeing Austria because Hitler had annexed Aust Austria. This is an event called the Anschluss. And uh, it's, an, it's essentially he just made Austria part of greater Germany at that point. And uh, he implemented a kind of rushed version of the Nuremberg Laws there. And many Jews decided this was the time to flee. And they began piling up in refugee camps, sometimes labor camps, in neighboring countries. These countries have come to have a name, and they were called this at the time, called countries of transit. That's an interesting term. They were piling up in France and Switzerland and Italy even for a period of time, uh, in Netherlands and Belgium, right? And they were piling up in these camps. They were, in some cases, many of them were undocumented, what we would call undocumented today. They didn't have papers. Uh, and they were fleeing to get out of uh, greater Germany. Um, and these countries were being overrun by these refugees in many ways and didn't have the resources to care for them and wanted them to leave. Not today, but yesterday, right? Uh, at the same time, the United States government was getting requests to open up the United States to these refugees. Does this sound familiar to us? And, um, and FDR, who was the president at that time, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, was under a lot of pressure not to accept these refugees. Uh, public opinion was decidedly against relaxing the quota restrictions, which had been in effect since 1924, when Congress had passed the National Origins Bill, which limited the number of refugees from countries around the world to the United States. Why was this? Because the United States was still digging itself out of the Great Depression at this point. In 1938, there were still 10 million people out of work. The ratio, meant the unemployment rate, was a staggering 19.8% of Americans out of work in 1938. This is sometimes called Roosevelt's recession, right? Uh, so, you know, we know this story of Roosevelt passing a slew of social programs to put people back to work, to get them to work in the Depression. It only worked partially just by the fact that 1938 still many people were out of work. Does anyone know what the unemployment rate is in the United States today, right now? Yeah. Are you taking into account... Ah, very good. Go ahead. Ah, and also people who have given up looking for work, right? They're not in the official unemployment rate as well. So the official unemployment rate right now is 4.8%, right? Uh, 
which doesn't take into account these other groups, as you suggest, right? Um, but in fact, there is no comparison between how many people were out of work in 1938 and how many people are out of work today. Um, so because of that, public opinion was expressly against relaxing the, the, the quotas that were permitted under the National Origins Bill. Roosevelt did not want to buck public opinion at that time. And so as a result, he calls an international conference of refugees in a beautiful place, Evian, France. Yes, that's the same place where the water comes from, right on the border of Switzerland. And he essentially gently encourages, coerces 32 countries to send delegates to this conference. They don't want to be there. Why? Because they don't want to accept these refugees. We're talking about countries in Africa, in Latin America, Australia. They don't want to go. They don't want to attend. And Roosevelt has to tell them, come, come to the conference, listen to the problems that we have with these refugees piling up in countries of transit, but you do not have to change your immigration laws, right? If you don't want to, it's just as the United States was not willing to change its immigration laws. So anyone know what Evian spelled backwards is? Naive. Yes, that's a joke that our journalist, William Shirer, um, uh, who wrote a very famous book later about the Third Reich, um, said about the conference in Evian, France that really this was a naive conference to begin with because nobody had any intentions of accepting these refugees. And all of these Western European countries wanted these refugees out. One exception to that rule was the island of Hispaniola was the country Dominican Republic. And at that conference, the only country that was willing to get up there and say, they would accept these Central European Jews and they would take up to 100,000 refugees. Wow, this was incredible, right? Nobody was expecting that at this conference. And it was done because the dictator, Rafael Trujillo, who I'll show you a picture of. By the way, this is a picture of the settlement that they established in the Dominican Republic called Sasua in 1940, I'll have more to say about that later. So here's a picture of the island of Hispaniola. And if you, this is so cool, my daughter did this for me. Watch the little red arrow go to Sasua on the north coast. <laughs> hey, who says I'm a dinosaur, right? So that's where the settlement was where these refugees wound up. Not 100,000 though, and I'll have more to say about that. Here's a picture of the young dictator, Rafael Trujillo of the Dominican Republic. He ruled the country for 31 years. He was without a doubt one of the most brutal and ruthless dictators in modern Latin American history. And here he was saying that he was going to welcome in refugees who no one else in the world wanted at that time. So what's going on? There's got to be a catch. And there was. Trujillo was uh, virulently anti-Haitian, racist. And uh, Haitians were living in the western part of the country, often for generations. They established their businesses there, their farms. They had intermarried with Dominicans, particularly on the northwest coast. Large numbers of Haitians had migrated, searching for employment and labor in that part of the island. And Trujillo wanted to do something about it. He wanted to establish a, a firm boundary between the two countries, which was um, ill-defined at that particular point. He wanted to colonize that area and set up agricultural settlements. But more importantly, he wanted to bring in European immigrants who would intermarry with Dominicans to whiten the race. The term in Spanish is mejorar la raza and it was prevalent throughout the 1920s and 1930s throughout Latin America. If we could only convince white Europeans to come in, to intermarry, we would lighten the race. So Trujillo, right, was um, a virulent racist himself. That's why in October of 1937, he sent his army to that northwestern area 
And in an event that in Dominican history is called El Corte, the cutting down, they literally macheted to death 15,000 Haitians who were living in this area. It was one of the worst heinous massacres in modern Latin American history. I told you he was a nasty guy. All right? For this, he took a firestorm of criticism, not just from his neighbors in Haiti, but from all over the world. And especially, he took criticism from the United States. Sumner Wells uh, and uh, Cordell Hull, the Secretary of State and the Assistant Secretary of State, were very critical of Trujillo for obvious reasons. And he was concerned. Why? Because he was receiving large amounts of military and economic assistance from the US government. And now he was thinking about survival. Dictators often dwell on this. They worry about political opposition, and they are making sure that they can stay in power. So what does he do? When Roosevelt calls that conference in Evian, he sends his brother, who is ambassador to France, right? Uh, and he's the one who makes the offer of accepting 100,000 refugees. Now, there was a catch to this. They all had to be farmers. Right? He wanted to make his country self-sufficient in food, but more importantly, Trujillo was presiding over a kleptocracy. What's a kleptocracy? Anyone? Right? He, was, he had, had, corruption was rife in the Dominican Republic. He owned all of the monopolies, he and his cronies and family members. He dominated virtually every aspect of the Dominican economy, and he didn't want competition from merchants, and businessmen coming from places like Berlin and Vienna who could compete with Trujillo's monopolies. So he said, you can come, we'll even provide you with land, but you must be farmers. All right? So, such is the offer, and overnight Trujillo is transformed from a pariah, an international pariah, to a great humanitarian. Everybody has forgotten about El Corte, and they are now, the international press is praising Trujillo for taking these Jewish refugees in. So the irony behind that book that I wrote, Tropical Zion, is that one racist dictator, Hitler, is trying to get rid of these refugees, and another racist dictator, Trujillo, is welcoming these refugees. Think about it. You can't make this stuff up, right? That's why history is so fascinating, right? So, Trujillo welcomes these refugees under the condition that they be farmers, but he needed assistance in doing this. So he partners with a Jewish philanthropy in New York City one of the biggest philanthropies in the world at that time. It was called the Joint Distribution Committee. We can shorten it to the joint, right? The joint, or the JDC, the Joint Distribution Committee, was created during World War I, and the purpose of it was to resettle Jews who had become displaced during World War I. And they continued that project of resettlement in the interwar period. And so now we have a crisis in Europe, and the joint has to act. And it wants to use the Dominican Republic as a test tube, as an experiment. Because if they can create farmers from Jewish people, professionals, well-educated people in many cases, businessmen, and turn them into practical farmers in the countryside, then maybe other Latin American countries will open their doors. And then there will be homes for these refugees in Europe. That was the goal. And FDR was all on board. Why? Because he didn't want them. He didn't want to loosen the quota restrictions in the United States. Everybody with me? The joint were not incurable romantics. This is where it gets even more interesting, and I knew nothing about this when I started this project. They had been doing this for more than 20 years. Where? With another dictator. A dictator that 
arguably was even more ruthless than Trujillo, and that was Joseph Stalin. The joint had collaborated with Stalin by bringing, get this, 150,000 Jews out of the ghettos of Western Russia, who Stalin thought were corrupt, petty capitalists, weren't with the socialist project that he was trying to create, and he was going to take them out of the slums of those cities and transfer them to the Crimea, which is in southeastern Russia, and southwestern Russia, and also the southern Ukraine. And they were going to be established in cooperatives. And the joint was going to provide the capital, the technology, and the know-how. And the Soviets were going to provide the land for these cooperatives. And for the better part of 20 years, these Jews were transformed into farmers, cooperative farmers. And the person who was responsible for that was a Russian Jew by the name of Joseph Rosen. I'll show you a picture of him in a little bit. And the reason why he's important to my story, right, is that in the late 1930s, Stalin becomes xenophobic, very distrustful of all foreigners. And he also has a number of purges. Many of the Jewish leaders who participated in the cooperatives are killed. Rosen is forced out. The joint can no longer operate by 1938 in the Crimea and southern Ukraine. Where does Rosen go? He goes back to headquarters of the joint in New York City, and they say, we've got a job for you. It's in the Dominican Republic. We want you to do what you did in the Crimea in the Dominican Republic. That is, establish cooperatives there and establish themselves. So this peculiar partnership between a racist, racist Dominican dictator and a Jewish philanthropy desperate to resettle Jews from refugee camps seems to be a marriage made of convenience right, at this particular time. Everybody with me? Right? It's going to get a little bit more confusing. Now we're going to talk about Roosevelt during this time. So Roosevelt is preparing the United States for war. He's convinced that the United States is going to have to fight a war against the Axis powers, against Italy and Germany and Hitler and Mussolini. And he is, in a sense, wants to create uh, an American sphere of influence in the Americas. He calls it Fortress America, to make it impermeable to Nazi infiltration. He wants all Latin American countries to collaborate with the United States to keep out Nazis from the Western Hemisphere. And he is remarkably successful, or his, his advisors in the State Department are remarkably successful in doing so. Only one country in Latin America is not part of Fortress America, and that would be Argentina, which remained neutral. And for that, the United States would punish Argentina economically uh, with sanctions. But the rest of Latin America were on the same page. So when I began working on this project, and I am finally getting to the project, right? When I began working on this project, I did a number of interviews with some of the farmers who were resettled there, some of the refugees. And what was surprising to me is that they all came to Ellis Island, right? When we think of Ellis Island, we think of what? The gateway to the United States, where refugees from Europe came in, and they were welcomed by Lady Liberty. Uh, give me your tired, give me your poor, your huddled masses. That's the poem by Emma Lazarus, right? There is a museum on Ellis Island today that celebrates the very positive story about welcoming immigrants. And what I discovered in my interviews was a common refrain. All of these refugees came to Ellis Island, and instead of being welcoming tonight to the United States, they were prevented from coming to the United States. Ellis Island was a place to keep them out almost like a temporary prison 
until they made their way down to the Dominican Republic, a way station. So um, that's where I'm going to start this story um, that I'm going to tell you here. And so this question began to confound me, right? Um, how nations confronting fear can turn into very unwelcoming places. In this case, the effects proved catastrophic, not just for Jewish refugees who were denied entry, but later on during the war, 110,000 Japanese Americans were interned in camps because they were thought to be uh, potential collaborators with the Japanese military and government. And also, I don't know if many of you know this, but 11,000 German Americans were interned in camps in places like Texas uh, and Idaho um, and because they were thought to be potential uh, uh, spies for the Nazis. So, um, you know, this story became very, very intriguing to me. So I'm going to start off with one person, and I'm going to let him uh, talk a little about, a bit about his experience. Quote, Dr. Trone asked me if I was afraid of hard work. He chose me because I was young and strong, Heinrich Wasserfogel remembered. Solomon Trone, a recruitment agent for the Dominican Republic Settlement Association, DORSA, if you had a look at the reading that I sent you, DORSA was the subsidiary of the joint who managed the settlement in the Dominican Republic, right? The joint provided the funds, DORSA were the managers of the farming settlement that was established there. So a recruiting agent for DORSA shows up in Zurich in Switzerland and interviews Wasserfogel in the summer of 1940. Dorsa's recruiter was looking for pioneers for this new settlement in Sisua. For the last half year, Heinrich had worked at a number of labor camps run by Swiss provincial authorities. He had never heard of the Dominican Republic, he knew no Spanish, and had no experience as a farmer. But like many refugees stranded in countries of transit, he was in Switzerland, he had gone illegally there across the border, he had few appealing options. The refugees who came to the Dominican Republic in the early 1940s could not have imagined that they would become, in a few short years, successful dairy farmers. Although they had much in common, language, customs, their faith, exposure to discrimination back home, minimal experience on the land, and the anguish and uncertainty of leaving family members behind in Europe, and that will become important in my story, personal histories varied, and so too did the situations they encountered and the choices they made in flight. They were fortunate to benefit from the timely assistance of complete strangers, Gentiles, as well as Jews, Gentiles are non-Jews, and generous relief agencies like the Joint. 87-year-old Eli Topf might have spoken for all of his peers when he told me, quote, I will tell you my story, but you won't believe it. I was a hundred times lucky, unquote. In truth, Topf, Wasserfogel, and others who reached Sisua made their own luck, overcoming adversity and thinking on their feet when opportunity knocked or danger presented itself. Whether they used their last francs to pay off smugglers, to spirit them across borders, plied forged papers, bribed diplomats to purchase visas, eluded capture by authorities intent on deporting them back to Nazi-occupied territory, worked unlawfully in countries of transit, or bartered for cigarettes, chocolate, or a piece of bread, they lived by their wits and did what was necessary to survive. Arriving in New York Harbor, Wasserfogel, like others, was overcome by the sight of Lady Liberty, but then just as quickly disappointed when he was dispatched on a small launch to Ellis Island where he waited for a week for a steamer that would take his group to the Dominican Republic. Fifty years later, a colleague of his told an interviewer, quote, we knew that America doesn't want us, but we overcame it. 
unquote. That 10-day stopover on Ellis Island, on the outside looking into America, made a powerful impression on the refugees. Manhattan's skyline was so temptingly close that some of his fellow travelers longed to cut short their trip right then and there. So here's Wasserfogel, right? And here is a picture of them in New York Harbor. And uh, Wasserfogel is right down here on the bottom right, kneeling. Ellis Island had a very different meaning to refugees in transit than it did for those who were lucky enough to be waiting entry in the United States. It did not escape their attention that despite its relatively pleasant accommodations, the island had been designed by authorities to keep them out of the United States. The visitors were locked up every evening, and the bedrooms, baths, and dining hall had no windows. The only windows, quote, were in the big hall, two stories high and barred with steel and wire, constantly visible to the guard on duty, one informant remarked. When they left their sleeping quarters for the great hall where they dined, a guard with a counter ticked them off one by one to make sure that all were present and accounted for. Even the area where refugees could meet relatives was screened. To be treated like potential criminals at Ellis Island when their only offense was having fled from Hitler was disappointing to those who idealized the United States. We can imagine the ambivalence that Wasserfogel and others shared about their predicament. Thankful about leaving Europe behind, but uncertain about their future in the Dominican Republic, the emigres were just a stone's throw away from a glistening world in New York that they had heard so much about from relations and friends. New York City was at once new and exciting, and yet comparable to where they came from, metropolitan centers of Central Europe, culture, education, and economic opportunity awaited those fortunate enough to possess a prized visa. Realistically, why would they want to go anywhere else? Yet, like Moses gazing longingly at Canaan, they were denied entrance due to a restrictive quota system instituted by the US Congress. Instead, they set their sights on Sisua. The newcomers were no longer unwanted stateless exiles. They were about to become farmers in the tropics. So this is a picture I really like because it shows all of these refugees about to go down to the Dominican Republic, expectant, very happy. And soon after my book came out, this was on the cover of my book, this picture, um, I got an email from New Zealand. And he said, I got your book on Amazon. And you see that picture on the front cover of your book? You see the little boy in the lap of the gentleman there? That's me, Georgie Schimmel. I was three years old when that picture was taken and I was sitting on my uncle's lap. So these are the kind of things that happen now in our interconnected world, right? All right, but why the detour to Ellis Island? When I interviewed Wasserfogel 50 years later, he had no idea. The more I looked into this, the more fascinating this part of the story became. Little did his first group from Switzerland know, but their routing to Ellis Island was not accidental. To make it to the promised land of Santo Domingo, the capital of the Dominican Republic, the refugees first needed a transit visa to the United States. And getting one of those in 1940 was no small feat. A stopover in Ellis Island and the vetting process that went on enabled the State Department to track European immigrants and in theory to keep Nazi spies out of Latin America. To bring a refugee to Sisua, the joint had to obtain a Dominican visa as well as a US transit visa. And that required the interventions of two Dominican ministries and their counterparts in the State Department and the Justice Department. Then it was a question of waiting and the wait could seem like an eternity. For those concerned, 
for berths on a ship willing to risk the dangerous trip across the Atlantic. Because remember, the war is on, the Nazis have submarines in the Atlantic, it was a, you know, a perilous undertaking. It should be emphasized that this bureaucratic maze was reflective of a major change in Washington's thinking about Sasua. Remember, they were initially bullish on Sasua. Now they'd gone 180 degrees. What caused it? Robert Pell, who headed up the refugee desk at the State Department, had this to say about Sasua in January 1940. He says, Sasua was perhaps the only test tube which we have in this hemisphere at this time for studying the ways and means of arriving at the right way of life and relieving the frightful pressure resulting from a sick Europe. Like any scientific experiment, it must be approached with great care. Each move must be carefully weighed in the laboratory. Ooh, this sounds what? It sounds clinical. It sounds like Sasua is some kind of scientific experiment to see whether these refugees could prosper in the tropics, right? These were informed by theories of uh, eugenics at that particular time. I'll be glad to take questions about that later. But even as the first settlers were arriving, the Dominican and North American governments were backing away from their earlier ringing endorsements as security concerns trumped all, uh, no, no pun, trumped all other matters. After so much, I'm glad you got that, yeah. After so much optimism and goodwill, four months before at the contract signing between the Dominican government and DORSA, the war threw a wrench into the plans of Dominican officials, Jewish philanthropists, and North American State Department officers. Only 252 colonists reached Sasua by the end of 1940. Remember, Trujillo said he would take what? 100,000. We're talking really painfully small here. Many factors impinged on settling the colony. The shipping problem that I talked about during wartime, State Department fears of Nazi infiltration into the Americas, and this is probably the most important point, Washington's subsequent refusal to take any Jewish refugees from German-occupied territory. The reason why that's significant is that by the spring of 1940, all of Central Europe and almost all of Western Europe was German-controlled territory. All those former refugees, all those refugees who were in countries of transit trying to get out are what? They're stuck, right? They're stuck because the United States would not give transit visas to people from German-occupied territory. And if they couldn't get a transit visa, they couldn't get into the Dominican Republic. So it was like what? A block in the, in the process to get them in there. So each, each refugee, had to be first checked in Washington and then in the Dominican Republic, and the Dominican government's outspoken frustrations with the slow pace of building the settlement and the type of immigrants brought to the country was voiced. Also slowing efforts to bring in settlers was the unanticipated high cost of extracting refugees from Europe. It soon became obvious that the original offer of 100,000 refugees would never come to pass. The end result was a far cry from initial projections. Only 757 refugees made it to the Dominican Republic during the course of World War II. It was the external dynamic, a succession of lightning quick German victories throughout Western Europe during the last six weeks of the spring of 1940, the emigrants who were dislocated in countries of transit as ports closed 
and the number of transatlantic ships declined precipitously, and Roosevelt's concern about a fifth column threat, fifth column threat, internal traders. The United States had, in 1940, more than 200,000 German Americans. And there was a general perception that some of those German Americans might be more loyal to the Third Reich than they were to their new homeland. All of a sudden now, those German Americans were suspect. And so too were the refugees. And that was initially baffling to me. Why? Because these refugees hated Hitler, right? They would, you know, how could they become Nazi spies? And the answer that was given is because many of them had relations, they had relatives back in Europe. The Nazis could blackmail these refugees, right? and force them to become saboteurs or spies for the Nazi war machine. And the reason why, and why do they call it the fifth column threat? This is really interesting. That term comes out of the Spanish Civil War from 1936 to 1939, when the forces of fascism and General Franco were laying siege to the Spanish Republican capital of Madrid. And there were four columns of fascist soldiers surrounding the city. But the fifth column were internal traitors who eased the fascist forces into Madrid and led to the collapse of the Spanish Republic. And the same thing people were saying about the Nazi triumph through Western Europe, that there were internal traitors in places like France, in Belgium and the Netherlands, which helped the Nazis conquer those countries in relatively short order. So Roosevelt gave his fireside chat in 1940, and he talked about the fifth column threat, which he called a Trojan horse. We all remember the story of the uh, uh, Iliad, right? And the Trojan horse. And these were enemies at the gate. So um, the thing that we have to keep in mind about this, which is really interesting, is, is that until October of 1941, the policy of the Third Reich was to expel these Jews. After October 1941, when the Nazis decided on the final solution, the strategy turned to what? Eliminating these these <coughs> European Jews, right? So up to that point, the Nazis want the Jews out of Germany. They can't take their property with them. They can't take their uh, belongings with them, but they don't want them. Only October, after October 41 does that change. Okay. So um, Hitler did not closed the door to Jewish emigration till mid-1941. Uh, Washington refused to take in refugees from the occupied territories, meant that Dorsa had to take whatever they could get. Neither the leader of the settlement nor Trujillo seriously questioned the administration's policies. For Rosenberg here, who was the chief um, uh, officer of the Dorsa, was a New York bankruptcy lawyer, who oversee, oversaw fundraising for the settlement, he had little recourse but to follow State Department directives. Certainly, the colony did not meet Trujillo's expectations either, but loyalty was its own reward for him, assuring him continued U.S. support. His rule went unchallenged, always his first priority. But what had been a menage a trois among three bedfellows with some measure and give and take, now gave way to Trujillo and Dorse's uncritical acceptance of Roosevelt's Fortress America. In a confidential memo, here they are, um, the first settlers arriving in Sasua in 1937. This quote says, very interesting, one of the settlers said, 
People spat and hissed at us on the streets of Vienna. Other people can call Trujillo a murderer, but he saved our lives. So these refugees were grateful, even though they knew that Trujillo was uh, 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 a ruthless dictator. So here's Rosenberg giving a speech to raise money. Here's Rosen, the man who would manage the settlement in the Dominican Republic in the first years. He was the one from Russia who would set up cooperatives in Russia. And this is a rather long quote that I'll just summarize here. From the beginning, the State Department evidenced that Dorse's immigration policy were subject to their approval. In other words, Dorsa couldn't take anybody they wanted. They had to first be approved by the State Department. In other words, the State Department was going to give them, with the Justice Department, those valuable transit visas that were going to get people to Ellis Island where they could be vetted. They asked for and received Dorsa's detailed reports and cooperation and assurance that no immigration matter would be taken up with the Dominican government before clearance with them. And this is by the executive secretary of Dorsa, and she was intimately involved. She had to create a folder, a file, for each one of the refugees to prove that they weren't Nazi spies, that they were good, respectable people who had responsible jobs back in Europe, uh, and that they were grateful to come to the Dominican Republic to start a new life. So Becky Ryer is stating here, the history of immigration to the Dominican Republic, as far as Dorsa is concerned, would warrant the belief that Dominican authorities, in all cases, as indicated to us by the Dominican ambassador, Minister Pastoriza and others, was always considered by that government in relation to whatever the wishes of the United States government might be, and that in consulting our own government as to their views, we were not only doing so as an American organization operating in a foreign country, but because we knew that unless we got our direct answer from the American authorities, the same answer would be given to us in a more indirect way by Dominican offices. Translation, what is she saying here? The Dominican Republic is doing what the State Department and the US government wants. It's turning the spigot off on the refugees. It's cooperating with US policy to restrict refugees from fleeing Europe during this time, right? When a historian finds a quote like this, we do cartwheels, right? It's like pay dirt, right? QED. So I know it's long, but it makes the point that I'm trying to make here. Fortress America, here was Trujillo cooperating in a united front with the United States. The United States wanted to restrict Jewish refugees from coming to the United States, but also what? To Latin America, right? Keeping them out of Fortress America. American concerns about Nazi infiltration were voiced just as the first refugees were to leave the continent. The swift capitulation of Western Europe had been attributed to well-planned infiltration of a cadre of Nazi agents disguised as professors, journalists, diplomats, tourists, and refugees in the months prior to the invasion. Sensationalistic media reports documented how German-born residents dressed in inconspicuous disguises shot at Dutch troops from ambushes or assisted German parachutists, and that had a profound effect on international public opinion. Even though historians would later offer correctives about the nature and extent of the fifth column's role in these conquests, the perception at the time on both sides of the Atlantic was that such activities were vital to the Nazi blitzkrieg. Unsubstantiated rumors and erroneous reports, some surreptitiously placed by British intelligence. Why would the Brits place phony reports? Yes, 
Well, they were misleading the Nazis, but they were saying about this fifth column threat, they were making it up. They really wanted what? Get more US yes, they wanted the US to enter the war on the side of the allies, allies on the side of the Brits. So they placed erroneous reports about the fifth column threat that didn't exist, right? If enemies were believed to be living among the general, general population, it is perhaps understandable why refugees became such handy scapegoats. Each time a refugee in the United States was rumored to be a spy, whether it was later corroborated or not, it lent credence to the restrictionist argument that excluding all refugees was a matter of national security. With questionable logic, officials also contended that closing the borders was justified because it warded off anti-Semitism at home by keeping Jews out. Targets of discrimination in their homelands and in the United States, Jewish refugees were victimized by a curious logic that gained greater resonance as it merged with fifth column paranoia. In May of 1940, FDR warned the Congress of Germans leapfrogging from North African bases to Brazil, and then sending ground troops up the isthmus through Central America to Mexico. It would be no time, he said, before a Luftwaffe air base in Tampico, Mexico, could strike at the American heartland. With more than 200,000 German-born residents in the United States, isolationist sentiment fed xenophobia and provoked a mania for security against imagined threats from foreigners. An obedient American public took the threat seriously. In just one day, in May of 1940, the FBI received more than 2,900 reports of suspected sabotage. By June, Congress had passed the Smith Act, which required aliens to register and be fingerprinted, and gave the government the power to deport current or past members of fascist and communist organizations. Roosevelt defended the need to watchdog refugees, invoking an alleged Nazi threat to shoot family members of German Jewish refugees unless the latter consented to work for the Third Reich as spies. A State Department memorandum went out to counselor agents in Europe, urging them to reject or suspend any application for a visa, quote, about which there is any doubt, unquote. The new regulations had the desired effect. Only 21,000 refugees were admitted from access controlled nations for the war's duration. Only 10% of the mandated quotas, and those quotas were really limited. If the new restrictive policies had not gone into effect and the, just the quotas had been met, an additional 190,000 persons might have made it to safety to the United States. State Department officials considered Latin America an inviting target for Nazi infiltration. Just as Hitler had conquered Western Europe, he could build support for fascism in the Southern Cone and then march northward to the US border. With the benefit of hindsight, it is clear that the US response to subversion in Latin America was well out of proportion to the threat. German military intelligence networks, even in Southern Cone nations, where, where substantial numbers of German nationals lived, were hastily built and poorly developed. The Reich made only token efforts in small countries like the Dominican Republic. But it didn't matter. The, the word was in, the Latin American countries cooperated, especially in the Central America and the Caribbean area, um, concluding it was unwise for the Republic to permit further immigration during the war. Such paranoia explains why Dorsa's first group would be the first and last group to come directly from German-occupied territory. Rosenberg told Rosen to inform Trujillo that uh, the association was taking the Nazi threat seriously. There is definitely an unfriendly attitude toward the settlement project in certain high Dominican quarters based on the fear that German immigrants will be traitors, Rosenberg said. 
I am not giving you this as gossip, but as reliable first-hand information. There is the same fear from Dominican army circles that German spies will be let in. The basis for all these fears is that people have, brought in, have been brought in directly from Germany. It seems pathetic to think that the poor, oppressed Jews of Germany should now be looked upon with suspicion, unquote. All right, I've been going on for a while, and um, I can take some more questions about this later, but I wanted to, I said at the beginning that I was gonna try to make some parallels between the 1940s and the travel ban today. So I wanna use the last part to, of the talk to talk about that, and then I wanna take your questions. You've been very patient. So at first glance, when I considered Trump, Trump's initial travel ban, right? Um, the parallels between then and now seemed striking to me. Just as in 1940, today we live in a moment when many are distrustful of foreigners and feeling economically insecure. In 1938, I told you about how many people were out of work. In both cases, within the State Department, opposition surfaced to the attempted restrictions. Some of you may have heard that when the initial travel ban was proposed by Trump, more than 1,000 State Department officials signed an internal cable of dissent against the original travel ban. The acting uh, attorney general was fired by Trump for objecting to the original travel ban. And now we have heard reports over the last few days that there have been a number of firings of high State Department officials because the Trump administration considers them disloyal. In other words, that they are not, in a sense, uh, copacetic with the new revised travel ban. Um, but we should be wary of facile comparisons. As brutal as the Islamic State is, ISIS is, I, I'd argue that it has never posed the threat to our way of life that Hitlerism did. If we think back to the spring of 1940, Great Britain and the United States were the last things remaining to keep Hitler from defeating the free world. Right? That was the reason for why there was such paranoia. Even though many Americans wanted to stay out of World War II, the country then was not as polarized as it is today. FDR was a popular two-term government go president about to win a historic third term later that fall. And he had earned the trust of many Americans. In fact, despite the looming humanitarian crisis in Europe in 1940, there was little sentiment to relax the quota restrictions and take in the refugees. Anti-Semitism, especially within the State Department at that time, should not be discounted as a contributing factor. War and economic uncertainty and gender fear and stoke distrust of foreigners. Roosevelt played upon those fears to help prepare the public for America's entry into World War II. In contrast, and this is my opinion, Trump has served as an echo chamber for the anxieties of his political base during his campaign, and now acts to fulfill his promises. The diplomatic consequences of this executive order are difficult to foresee. Sadly, history has provided ample evidence of the human costs. All right, one more thing before I turn it over to questions. So remember Mr. Wasserfogel that I introduced to you at the very beginning? One of the 757 refugees, that was my dad, All right? That's why I had an interest in this story. He was one of the lucky ones to get out of Europe. His family members were not so lucky. They all died in the Holocaust, right? So this story had particular resonance for me that in a sense, this restrictionist argument to keep refugees out of the United States and also Central America and the Caribbean would have an impact on the lives. And for many settlers, when I interviewed them about what it was like during World War II, they constantly talked about 
how frantic they were to get their loved ones out and how impossible it was to do so. All right, let's take your questions.